Every year, without fail for the past 10 years or more, Samsung has developed what many consider the de facto flagship phone of choice for Android users. And based on our time with the latest Galaxy S23, that winning streak isn't about to end anytime soon. I'm Cam Bunton from PocketLint, and I've been using the S23 for the past few weeks, and this is our review. Now, not a huge amount has changed between the Galaxy S22 and S23 on the design side, at least not from the front. That's no bad thing, the bezels around the display are among the skinniest we've seen on a phone, and they're impressively uniform, keeping that slimness around all four sides of the display and curving inside the rounded corners to match the radius of the external aluminium frame. With that and the centrally placed hole punch selfie camera, there's a delightful sense of symmetry. Add to that the fact that this is one of the smallest, lightest and most nimble flagships on the market, and the picture is even more impressive. It's thinner than the ASUS Zenfone 9 and the Xperia 5 Mark V, both of which offer that flagship power in a device that's smaller than the usual ultra-premium Android beer moths. One element I really like and is often underappreciated is the shaping of the aluminium edges. They're not completely flat and feature a subtle rounding around all four sides, and that makes the phone more comfortable to hold. So it's thin, light and comfy. That's a great combination. You don't have to sacrifice durability to get this compact form either. It's IP68 water and dust resistant, so it should survive just about anything in your daily life. Samsung's Armor Aluminium is back for another generation, offering a strong and sturdy chassis with Gorilla Glass Victus 2 on the front and the back to ensure the phone surface is as strong as it can be. It's not scratch proof, as we've proven, but it is tougher than older glass versions. Speaking of the back, this is where you see most of the obvious changes from the previous generation. The protruding camera unit on the left side has now been replaced by a cleaner row of individually ringed camera lenses. It's a very minimalist approach and one we're sure will appeal to a lot of style conscious buyers. From a practical standpoint, it also means the phone doesn't tend to wobble as much when you place it down on its back. Now, in an age where so many Android manufacturers only release their phones in one or two standard colours like black, grey or green, it's refreshing that Samsung continues its approach to appealing to a wider audience by offering a number of different options. This can differ per region, but in the UK, as an example, there are six colours to choose from, including a bright lime colour, a lavender pinkish colour and a beige cream colour as well as the black and graphite grey. Now, moving on to displays and software. The Days of Samsung's small flagship having Quad HD resolution displays are pretty much over now, and that's no bad thing really. Because the screen is relatively small at 6.1 inches, the Full HD Plus resolution is more than enough to ensure you have crisp details. You get over 400 pixels per inch, which in smartphone terms is strong. It also means the phone won't be wasting battery just on illuminating more pixels than is really necessary. Because text is fine and details are nice and crisp. Adding to that is the fact that everything on the screen appears really close to the surface, so viewing angles and clarity are fantastic. It's incredibly clear pretty much all the time, thanks to peak brightnesses up to 1750 nits, so it's clearly visible in bright daylight too. It's a much stronger display than what's on the Google Pixel 7 as an example. In its default vivid mode when first set up, it does massively over-egg the colours though, boosting saturation to a point that we found particularly unpleasant. Thankfully, there's an option in the settings to tune that down to natural, which for some might go too far the other way, making colours a bit more muted. For those who are happy to tinker though, there are more advanced options to choose from, and the ability to tweak the colour balance to your preference. Overall, it's a really strong display, and one that makes the most of all kinds of content. The contrast levels and incredibly bright peak brightness ensure that HDR content looks great too. Darker scenes can always look a little dark on HDR, but with Samsung, it doesn't seem to be that much of a problem. As for software, well, where to start? One UI is one of the biggest, most fully featured softwares available on Android. And that's a good thing, but sometimes there are decisions that leave us scratching our chins a little bit, like loading it with so many redundant duplicate apps that Samsung decides to put on there. As well as the fact that when you swipe up to the app drawer, you then have to swipe across to get to any extra apps, meaning that some apps are always in that top row, making them pretty hard to reach. Still, Samsung's dedication to bringing you software updates and security patches quickly is fantastic to see, and it's among the best performers in the Android market. You'll get updates for about four years for major software updates and five years for security patches. Now let's move on to performance and battery. And in the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, Samsung has used a chipset that's very capable. It's Qualcomm's most powerful chip to date and delivers the experience you'd expect it to. Games load quickly, touch response is quick, and the user interface glides under the fingers. We didn't notice any of the lag or stuttering we've seen on previous Exynos versions. And during longer gaming sessions, it didn't seem to get overly warm either. And was pretty consistent in performance after longer periods, continuing to offer for smooth refresh rates even after 30 minutes of gaming. I was pleasantly surprised by the battery performance on the S23 too. 
Looking at the spec sheet, the 3900 milliamp hour battery is quite low. One might assume you struggle to get through a day, but it appears that the battery optimizations of Android 13 and One UI combine with the power efficiency of the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chip to offer very good performance for its size. Now, it wasn't mind-blowingly good, but at the same time, with our moderate usage, which usually consisted of a couple of hours of Bluetooth music listening, half an hour or so of casual gaming, plus an hour or more of social media and web browsing, still have some juice left in the tank at bedtime, around 11 p.m., having taken it off charge at 8 o'clock in the morning. Most days, that level was below 30%, but it rarely got to the red line 19% level. For heavier users, those who move around a lot, commute to work, and use the phone regularly for calls during the day, you might find it a bit of a pinch to get through the day, especially if you're in a 5G area, which I'm not. The good thing here is that if you really want a similar experience but with a better battery, there's the S23 Plus. That gives you a massive 4,700 milliamp hours and pretty much all the same specs and features as this smaller S23. With many Android manufacturers like Xiaomi with the 13 Pro and OnePlus with the OnePlus 11, there's a race to be the fastest to refill a battery. Those two devices specifically can completely refill an empty battery in about 20 or 25 minutes, and their batteries are much bigger than the Galaxy S23s. Samsung's wired charging tops out at 25 watts, and that's only if you go out and buy a compatible charger, because it doesn't ship with one. If you do, it takes half an hour to charge half the battery, so we found we quickly settled back into our old routine of charging it overnight on a wireless charger by our bedside, because it didn't charge quickly enough for us to let it run until it was nearly empty. Now cameras, and with any fully featured flagship, a camera is an important part of the experience, and again, Samsung delivers in buckets as it always does. Its system is made up of three distinct cameras on the back, each offering a different focal length so you can switch between wide, ultra-wide, and a three times optical zoom. This gives you a lot of flexibility in what you can shoot, and will have you covered whether you like shooting portraits or landscapes. And for the most part, all three cameras match in terms of color and contrast in most conditions. Now it's safe to say that Samsung's photos have a recognizable look. At least, they do if you only ever leave your phone in its default mode and let it do its automatic thing. Samsung's Scene Optimizer has this habit of making colors and images extremely saturated, making blue skies very blue and grass an unnaturally vibrant shade of green. In good daylight, it delivers those classic Samsung images with lots of contrast and colors, giving the images that pop that a lot of people like. It's a little too hyper-real at times, making overcast days a little more colorful than they should be, but thankfully you can turn off the Scene Optimizer or even shoot completely manually, adjusting all manner of settings if you want to. There are a lot of things to play with and tweak in the camera app, lots of modes to choose from, and for some, that can be a bit overwhelming, but thankfully, it's easy enough to just leave it in regular photo mode and just point and shoot. For those who want to, though, there are features like Expert RAW, which will allow you to extract lots more data from your images, giving you more flexibility in the edit, so you can edit in apps like Lightroom and retain that visual fidelity that you'd want. Indoors, away from bright daylight, we found Samsung's contrast heavy push meant the images had that artificial looking sharpness a lot of the time, and shadows that were a little noisier than we'd expect. At night time, its night mode capability means you can snap a bright, vibrant shot even in very low light situations. It only seems to take a couple of seconds to capture a shot too on any of the three cameras, and it does a really good job of drawing in lots of light. The ultra-wide camera does seem to struggle a little with detail, with those AI-powered longer exposures having quite a fuzzy appearance to them. You could argue perhaps that this night mode approach makes night scenes a little too bright too, and colors often, as in daytime, are a little too vibrant, but it's an impressive capability nonetheless. Its video performance is admirable too, offering 8K video recording, so there's lots of flexibility here for those who want high resolution video. In the end, if you're after a powerful, feature-rich flagship smartphone that's small and light, there are a few that match the Galaxy S23. It's the do-everything Android phone for 2023 and the one that's easiest to recommend to just about everyone looking for a solid everyday device that'll last you the next three or four years. The only problem is it doesn't move the notch up significantly from the S22. And given that its predecessor is now cheaper and still has a few years of software and security patches to keep it up to date, it might be the more sensible option for most people. We certainly wouldn't advise you to upgrade from last year's model to this one. Still, in the context of this year's smartphone flagship market, few compact phones get as many of the key things right like the S23 does. It's got everything, and is undoubtedly the Android phone to buy if you want a proper flagship phone that isn't bulky. I've been Cam, let me know what you think of the S23 in the comments down below, or you can get me on Twitter. If you did like this video, please do leave a thumbs up, subscribe, and tap the notification bell, and that way you don't miss any more of our uploads. I'll see you again in the next one. Bye for now.